Hi everybody, this is Miss Heather and this is Miss Jennifer and it's time for our Ocean Mythology Part 3. Right? Three. Part 3. Yes. So today we are going to be talking about the legends of the deep and other various topics within that because there are very many branches we have gone on and off of. So let's get started. By in the deep we mean oceans and seas large. Yes. The main saltwater bodies of water. Yes. Okay. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is the Flying Dutchman. The Flying Dutchman is the most famous ghost ship. Um, disappeared around the Cape of Good Hope in a storm in the mid-1600s. According to legend, the captain was cursed and now his ship and crew must sail the seven seas forever. The ship disappeared in the mid-1600s, but there have been reported sightings in both the 19th and the 20th century. This is a painting that was made of the Flying Dutchman um, haunting a ship at sea. The most famous report about witnessing the Flying Dutchman was a report filed by the future King George V of England in 1881. He was sailing with his brother. Um, he made the report July 11th at 4 a.m. The Flying Dutchman crossed our bows. Strange red light as of a phantom ship all aglow in the midst of which lights the masts, spars, and sails of a brig 200 yards distant stood out in a strong relief as she came up on the port bow where also the officer of the watch from the bridge clearly saw her, as did the quarter-deck midshipman, who was sent forth forward at once to the forecastle. But on arriving, there was no vestige nor any sign whatsoever of a material ship was to be seen either near nor right away unto the horizon, the night being clear and the sea being calm. Thirteen people altogether saw her. At 10.45 a.m., the ordinary seaman who had this morning reported the Flying Dutchman fail, fell from the four top mast cross trees on the top gallant forecastle and was smashed. So the watchman who spotted it died. Yeah. So the next one we have is um, the burning ship of Numberland Strait. Um, as far back as 1786, a burning ship was reported in the waters off Prince Edward Island in Canada. So, just up there. Um, the ship consistently described as three-mast schooner on fire has no known origin. Those who have seen the ship claim they saw crew members climbing up the ship's masts and numerous reports mention the sound of gunfire. Whatever it is appears so real that the rescue parties have actually been sent out only to have the ship go and disappear again. The next one we're going to talk about is the Mary Celeste. The Mary Celeste set sail in November of 1872 and was found less than a month later off of the Azores sailing, but abandoned. The ship was seaworthy. It still had six months worth of food and water in the hold. So what happened? The crew's personal effects and valuables were all untouched and on board, as was the cargo, which ruled out pirates. One lifeboat was gone, but that doesn't explain why the captain and crew would abandon a perfectly good ship. And to this day, nobody knows for sure what happened. Mm -hmm. I have a picture. This is the actual Mary Celeste, which existed until they could take an actual picture of it. Mm -hmm. So now we are on to ocean creatures of the deep. So the first one we have up is a siren. We've talked a lot about sirens and nymphs. And like I said, they cross over into different legends and myths um, within the ocean parameters. One of the scariest mythological creatures that are said to exist in the ocean is a siren. Sirens are allegedly women who lure pirates, sailors, and anyone else controlling a boat to wreck it after failing, falling prey to the beauty and sexuality of these mysterious creatures. They might sing beautiful songs and perform flirtatious dances to make sailors steer their boats into dangerous areas or rocky shores. Um, the humans demise. Um, after that, the sirens harvest what they can from the boat, including the men. Although never actually seen, um, sirens have been an explanation for many boats and sailors to have gone missing. Some sailors have even claimed to see that sirens escaped their mesmerizing ways. Although mostly a legend, who knows if these evil creatures actually exist? And in some of the other mythology, they actually have wings. In the Greek and the Roman mythology, they have wings and have depicted as such. 
Um, the next one um, is man eating seaweed. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very um, swampy. According to old folklore, stories of the carnivorous seaweed and the sarg Sargasso Sea were responsible for a number of crew disappearances in the 1800s. The body of water is known for its massive accumulation of sargasm or collectives of certain types of dense brown seaweed. Um, a number of empty ships have been found sailing its waters with crew members like that of the Mary Celeste gone just without a trace. There is no evidence or any type of seaweed with such man-eating quality. So where exactly did the details of this urgent legend come from and have been yet to be explained? The next creature we're going to talk about is a leviathan. A leviathan is, uh, the origin of it is from uh, Judean myth about a fire meets water creature. Legend states that the leviathan combined fire and water, which are two of Earth's natural elements in its ploys to massacre innocent sailors. This fire-breathing sea monster would heat up the surrounding water until it began to boil, which would melt the skin off of the victims, and subsequently they would endure a violent and painful death. Mm -hmm. The Leviathan um, is even mentioned in the Bible, where it is referred to as a savage primordial sea serpent, feared for its ruthless nature and cruel behavior. So this is mm -hmm. a picture of the Leviathan. which is pretty scary and huge. There's a reason why people should stay out of the water. <clears throat> um, related, or, or from another mythology, mm -hmm. um, is the creature known as the Ninjin. The Ninjin originated in Japan and is about a scary sea creature uh, that resembles a human in that it had arms and legs and five-fingered hands and a human-like face. However, a close look, you would notice that it was missing a nose, also it's massive. Yeah. Um, adding to its horrifying demeanor, the ninja had a fin and tail and was considered a cold-blooded killer who tirelessly tortured, ta that's a tongue twister, tireless tirelessly <laughs> tortured sailors by murdering them and dragging their lifeless bodies along the surface of the sea to taunt <laughs> other shipmen. This is a picture of the ninja which you'll see it has a human-like face sort of and the arms are down below it and legs extending out behind it. Um, I would add somewhere between the Leviathan and the ninja there is also the creature which we talked about last week that uh, is called Cthulhu um, and these things are like ancient monster gods of the ocean. Yeah. Okay so next we go to Ikuturso, Finland's Ikuturso, um, can translates to the internal torso or torso, and was considered the ultimate savage that resembled a giant octopus with long tentacles and suckers. When the Ikuturso became enraged, it would even spout dragon-like mm. wings that were especially terrifying. Could you imagine that? Mm. <laughs> While the Ikuturso typically kept itself when provoked, it had a fearsome and fiery temper and would lash out aggressively at anyone who came into its path. Um, the next creature is the serene coin, um, which originated from Scottish myth. This creature is a gigantic creature that was considered a serious threat to the things that it hunted. It cruelly enjoyed torturing its victims first and was able to lure victims in to play with them by shrinking down into a tiny fish just the size of a human hand which fishermen would mistake for a passive fish, and then it would quickly transform back into its original immense size and swallow the unsuspecting fishermen in one big bite, um, which is not unlike Jonas. In the yeah. um, some even say that the Thuringroin was so large, it would often eat multiple whales in a single meal. Yeah. Big mouthful. Big old mouth. So the next one we're gonna go to are mermaids and mermen, which I have a picture I'll show you after the description. Um, mermaids are usually considered lucky, but not universally. In Trinidad and Tobago, sea-dwelling mermen were known to grant a wish, transform mediocrity and genius, and confer wealth 
and power. Mermaids appear in British folklore as unlucky omens, both foretelling disaster and provoking it. Several variants of the Ballad of Sir Patrick Spins depicted mermaids speaking to the doomed ships. In some versions, she tells them they will never see land again. In others, she claims they are no near shore, um, that they are near shore, excuse me, which are wise enough to know means the same thing. Mermaids can also be a sign of approaching rough water, and some have been described as monstrous in size up to 2,000 feet. That's pretty exaggerated in my opinion, but so here is a picture of what was resembled to be a mermaid. Oh, I have more things, sorry. So Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tale, The Little Mermaid, was published in 1837. The original version, The Little Mermaid is a youngest daughter of a sea king who lives at the bottom of the sea. To pursue a prince, to pursue a prince with whom she has fallen in love, the mermaid gets a sea witch to give her legs and agrees to give her up her tongue in return. Though she is found on the beach by the prince, he marries another. Told she must stab the prince in the heart to return for her sisters. She could not do it without the love for him. She could not do it because she still loved him. Um, she then rises from the ocean and sees ethereal beings around her to explain that the mermaids who do good deeds become daughters of the air. And after 300 years of good service, they can earn a human soul. Sailors will look for mermaid purses on beaches and signs of mermaids in the area. Um, the next creature that we're going to talk about is the kraken. The Kraken is pretty famous in all kinds of uh, lore. The, the Kraken was the creature in the Egyptian mythology that was summoned um, that Poseidon fought. Yes. Um, in other literature, it was mentioned in 13th century Icelandic sagas as the sea-dwelling Kraken, a terrifying monster. It can reach the, side, reach the top of a sailing ship's main mast mast wrap its many tentacles around the hull and capsize it the crew will either drown or gets eaten by the fearsome colossus with a beast like that awaiting sailors it's astonishing that that they ever left land um, the kraken myth had its origin in something that was quite real historians say that the legend derives from sailor eyewitness accounts of a giant squid this species which can reach 60 feet in length is reported is large enough to fight toothed leviathans such as sperm whales. Um, it's been reported to attack ships. The Kraken is from Norse mythology, um, popular wellspring of science fiction and fantasy writers, like all mythology. Um, the creature was excluded from later editions of zoological and botany texts. Um, because it was mythology. Um, and it's later described as a unique monster that is said to inhabit the seas of Norway. Although the person that wrote about it admitted they'd never actually seen one. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to fix this real quick. We're a little crooked here. Here. Oh. Now we're crooked the other way. It's fine. It'll be fine. There. <laughs> so the next one we have, I'm really excited about this one for us too. So it's called a kaiju. So is it a kaiju is a Japanese word that literally translates to strange creature. However, the word kaiju has been translated and defined in English as monster. Specifically, it is used to refer to a genre tukusatsu. I'm so sorry for butchering that word. Um, entertainment. Kaiju films usually showcase monsters in any form attacking a major Japanese city or or engaging another or multiple monsters in battle. An example of kaiju is Godzilla, Anguirus, Rodan, Rogira, Mothra, Maguma, Uduku, Ibira, and Byron. So these are our kaiju. So we have the classic Godzilla, and then we have our more modern Godzilla with the Rodan. So exciting. <laughs> So next we have pirate superstitions, and Jennifer's going to kick that one off. Um, so we're going to first talk about uh, superstitions that were bad luck. Mm -hmm. um, the superstition of red sunrises. Sailors were taught that if sunrise is red, to take warning, the day ahead will be dangerous. There's an old saying for those that work on the sea, mm -hmm. red sky at night, sailors delight, red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. 
Um, it can also be said another way as red at morning, sailor's warning, red at night, sailor's delight, or red sky at night, sailor's delight, red sky at morn, sailor be warned. This, say, this saying actually has some scientific validity, although it assumes storm systems will approach from the west and is therefore generally correct only at the mid-latitudes uh, where, due to the rotation of the earth, prevailing winds travel west to east. If the morning skies are red, it is because clear skies over the horizon to the east permit the sunlight, the sun to light the undersides of moisture-bearing clouds. Conversely, in order to see red clouds in the evening, sunlight must have a clear path from the west, so therefore the prevailing westerly winds must bring clearer skies. Basically, this means that if there is a red sky, sun, or clouds in the morning, it might mean that there will be a storm or severe winds will come. Yep. Although, if there is a red sky, sun, or clouds at night, there will be clear skies, soft or no winds, and you'll have a good day ahead of you. It's a weather forecasting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So next we have what's called a Jonah. We've all heard about Jonah and the whale, and it's biblical, biblical um, connection. So a Jonah is a long-established expression among sailors, meaning a person, either a sailor or passenger, who has bad luck, which is based on biblical prophet Jonah. Clergymen are considered to be bad luck as well, as they are all of Jonah's ilk. Redheads and women are also to be avoided as passengers. Um. The other is unlucky days of the week. Uh, Friday is considered to be an unlucky day in some cultures. Uh, perhaps most enduring sailing superstition is that it is unlucky to begin a voyage or set sail on a Friday. However, that was not universal. Not universal. Um, in the 19th century, Admiral William Henry Smythe uh, wrote as Friday being the day to take to set sail. So the next we have is albatross. The albatross is a superstitious relic is referred to in Samuel Taylor's Coleridge's well-known poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. It is considered very unlucky to kill an albatross, which is a bird, in Coolidge's poem. The narrator killed the bird and his fellow sailors eventually to force him to wear the dead bird around his neck. Um, a very quick one that is mostly comical, bananas. Bananas are bad luck. Bananas. It was considered bad luck to have a banana on a pirate ship or fishing yacht. Um, the origin of that is unknown, and I suppose that would cause problems if you were transporting bananas from the tropics to other parts of the world. <laughs> yes, that would have not been great transportation for South America and Africa. No. No. <laughs> so, Although, yeah. Whistling. Um, so whistling is usually considered to be bad luck with the possible exception of the sources mentioned below. It is said that to whistle is to challenge the wind itself and that to do so would bring about a storm. Another tale has that been considered bad luck ever since the mutiny aboard the HMS Bounty. Fletcher Christian um, is said to have used a whistle as a signal to begin mutiny against Captain William Bly. So next we have good luck. <clears throat> um... Just like they had lots of bad luck and ill omens, they also had good luck and mm -hmm. things that they believed brought them fortune. Uh, the first of those things is cats. In many cultures, a black cat crossing your path is unlucky, but British and Irish soldiers considered adopting a black ship's cat would bring them luck. Um, a high level of care was directed towards keeping the cats happy. And the logic behind that is cats hunt rodents, and rodents can damage roads and stores of grain on board, as well as spread disease among passengers and crew. Um, and the cats would help keep that under control. Mm -hmm. Research has backed this up, backed up this superstition with evidence published in 2017 by a geneticist at the University of Leuven showed that Egyptian cats spread their mitochondrial DNA through shipping lanes to medieval Northern European, primarily cats, resulting in a genetic study concluded that cats were also carried on trade ships to control rodents. The practice was adopted by traders from other nations, including Vikings in, the North, in Northern Germany from the eighth to 11th century. And just for the record, in Viking tradition, women who were establishing their own household were always given cats mm -hmm. and cats were considered good luck. Um, some sailors believe that pterodactyl, sorry, not pterodactyl, <laughs> no dinosaurs, 
<laughs> polydactyl <laughs> cats were better at catching pests, possibly connected with the suggestion that the extra digits gave the polydactyl cat better balance, which is important at sea. Mm -hmm. But we all know that cats have pretty good balance and cats land on their feet. Yes. Um, cats were believed to have miraculous powers that could protect ships from dangerous weather. Another popular belief was that cats could start storms through magic stored in their tails. Mm -hmm. If a ship's cat fell or was thrown overboard, it was thought that it would summon a terrible storm to sink the ship and that if the ship was able to survive, it would be cursed with nine years of bad luck. Other beliefs included that if a cat licked its fur against the grain, it meant a hailstorm was coming. And if it sneezed, it meant rain. And if it was frisky, it meant wind. <laughs> There's a reason why the Egyptians worshiped cats. So next we are gonna go on to pirates. Okay, the first round we have is the Barbosa brothers, which everybody's familiar with. The Pirates of the Caribbean. Pirates of the Caribbean, Captain Barbosa, okay? So sailing from North Africa, Barbary Coast, the Barbosa, which means red beard in Italian, brothers of Rouge and his ear became rich by captivate, capturing European vessels in the Mediterranean Sea. Though their most lucrative early victims included two papal galleys and a Sardian warship. They began targeting Spanish around the time Arouge lost an arm to the battle. By 1516, the Ottoman Sultan had essentially put Arouge in, in charge of an entire Barbary coast, a position that Heiser took over two years later following his brother's death. Herger, I'm terrible at pronouncing these, um, otherwise known as Kair Ednin, then spent the rest of his days fighting various Christian enemies, including a Holy League fleet specifically formed by the Pope to destroy him. Um, the next pirate we're going to talk about is Sir Francis Drake. He's a, um, Francis Drake was nicknamed My Pirate by Queen Elizabeth mm -hmm. I and was among the so-called Sea Dog Privateers licensed by the English government to attack Spanish shipping. Drake sailed on his most famous voyage from 1577 to 1580, becoming the first English captain to circumvent the globe. On that same trip, he lost four of his five boats, executed a subordinate for allegedly plotting mur mur mutiny, uh, raided various Spanish ports and captured a Spanish vessel loaded with treasure. A delighted Queen Elizabeth immediately knighted him upon his return. And eight years later, he helped to defeat the Spanish Armada. So he was a pirate to the Spanish, most certainly, mm -hmm. but he was a hero to the English. Exactly. And I have a picture. This is Sir Francis Drake. Kind of looks like William Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The collar. Yes. So the next one he has is Lil Alanis. Lil Alanis it was many, one of many buccaneers a cross between state-sponsored privateers and outright outlaws um, who plied the Caribbean Sea in the mid to late 1600s, also known as Jean David Nau. Le Onus is believed to have begun raiding Spanish ships and coastal settlements and cultivating a reputation for excessive cruelty soon after arriving in the Caribbean as a indentured servant. 17th century pirate historian Alexander, oh my gosh, Exclamillon, um, wrote that look, Kunos would hack his victims to pieces bit by bit or squeeze a cord around their necks until their eyes popped out. Suspecting that he had been betrayed, Lokonos supposedly once even cut a, out a man's heart and took a bite. Just sink that in. Karma came back to haunt him in 1668, however, when, according to Exclamon, he was captured and eaten by cannibals. Um, next, we're going to talk about Henry Morgan not to be mistaken for the MASH actor. Yep. Um, he was the best known pirate of the buccaneering era. Henry Morgan once pur purportedly ordered his men to lock the inhabitants of Puerto Rico principal Cuba inside of a church so that they could plunder the town unhindered. He then moved on to capture Portobello, Panama, in part by creating a human shield out of priests, women, and its mayor. Um, over the next few years, other brutal raids brought up against two towns in Venezuela and Panama City. 
And although Morgan was briefly arrested in 1672, he ended up serving as the acting governor of Jamaica in 1678. Um, and again, from 1680 to 1682. Um, ironically, the Jamaican legislature passed an anti-piracy law during his administration, and Morgan even assisted in pirate prosecution. So, um, <laughs> hey, not real sure what to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, one minute you're a pirate, the next you're a politician. Moving on. <laughs> so many things. So I have the next two because I want you to let Jennifer have the awesome pirate of all. Um, I have Captain Kidd, once a respected privateer. So you see where this is going. They're respected, and then they go to either being a full-on pirate or it's total reverse. They're a hero. Yeah, or they're a hero. Um, once a respected privateer, Captain William Kidd set sail in 1696 with the assignment of hunting down pirates in the Indian Ocean but he soon turned pirate himself. Shocking. Um, capturing the vessels such as the Quida merchant and killing a subordinate with a wooden bucket. Wow. Um, a massive defection left him with a skeleton crew for the journey home, which included a stop at New York's Gardner's Island to bury treasure. Having fun afoul with a powerful British East India Company, which was like a whole thing in itself. We could go on and on about that one. Kidd was arrested before making it back to England. He was then tried and executed as his decaying body was displayed from the banks of the River Thames as a warning to other pirates, which that was very, very common, especially in the Caribbean. They would just have big places where they would just hang him as a warning to other pirates coming into the bay. Um, the next one we have is Blackbeard. Um, he's probably one of the most famous of the pirates. Everybody knows about him. Um, born ever teach, Blackbird intimidated his en enemies by coiling smoke fuses into his long beard, braided facial hair, and by slinging multiple pistols and daggers across his chest. In November 1717, he captured a French slave ship, later renamed the Queen Anne's Revenge, and refitted it with 40 guns. Um, with that extra firepower, he then blockaded the port of Charleston, South Carolina, until the town's residents met his demands for a large chest of medicine. Which is very interesting. After laying low for a few months in North Carolina, Blackbeard was killed in a battle with the British Navy. Legend holds that he received 20 stab wounds and five gunshot wounds before he finally succumbed to his injuries. The so-called golden age of piracy, which Blackbeard was a major part of, would only last a few more years. But countless books, plays, and movies and from Treasure Island to Pirates of the Caribbean would later bring a romanticized version of that era squarely into public eye. So this is what they were talking about with him having his beard and it's smoking. It was very intimidating and he had more guns and knives on himself. Um, the last uh, pirate that I'm going to talk about um, is one of my favorites um, and proof that pirates were not just men. Mm -hmm. Zheng Yi Sao, also known as Madame Cheng, um, lived from 1775 to 1844. She was born Xi Yang, um, also known as Qi Xing. She was a Chinese pirate leader who was active in the South China Sea from 1801 to 1810. She was born to humble origins. She married a pirate herself. His name was Zheng Yi at age 26 in 1801. Um, Zheng Yi Sao was an honorific bestowed upon her by the people um, of Guangdong, meaning wife of Yang Yi. After the death of her husband in 1807, she took control of his pirate confederation with the support of his adopted son, Yang Bao, with whom she entered a relationship with and later married. Um, as the unofficial commander of the Guangdong Pirate Confederation, her fleet was comprised of 400 junks and between 40,000 and 60,000 pirates she was in charge of in 1805. Her ships entered into conflict with several major powers, including the East India Company, which we just mentioned, mm -hmm. the Portuguese Empire, and Queen China. In 1810, she negotiated surrender to the Queen authorities which allowed her and Zhang Bao to retain a substantial fleet and avoid prosecution. 
she basically had her own army. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Navy. <laughs> um, at the time of her surrender, she personally commanded 24 ships herself and was over 14, 000, sorry, 1,400 pirates. Mm -hmm. She died in 1844 at the age of 68, having lived a relatively peaceful and prosperous life since the end of her career in piracy. Xing Yi Sao has been described as history's most successful female pirates and one of the most successful pirates in all of history. Yep. And I have a picture. This is Madam Chang. Yep. And I like that, like, you know, we always refer back when it comes to pirates to Pirates of the Caribbean, but they gave a nod to her, Madam Chang, in the, one of the movies for the pirate lords. Um, the last and next... Um, last but not least, we have Calico Jack. Jock Ra John Rackham, better known as Calico Jack, received a pardon for previous piracy acts in 1719. Nonetheless, he headed back to sea for the following year, seizing a 12-gun sloop for Nassau Harbor in the Bahamas. Among, among Rackham's dozen or so followers were two only women pirates to play to ply Caribbean waters, Anne Bonnie had left her husband to be Rackham, while the other, Mary Reed, had purportedly been sailing for quite some time disguised in men's clothing, which was not uncommon for women of that time. Um, in October 1720, a pirate hunting boat overtook Rackham's drunken band. Um, only Bonnie and Reed, um, and perhaps one man, are believed to have offered any resistance. Though Rackham was executed the following month, his female crewmates escaped the hangman's noose because both were found to be pregnant. Reed died in prison soon after, and no one knows what became of Bonnie. So that concludes week three, or video three, of our ocean war for this week. Do you have anything to add, Miss Jennifer? Nothing that I can think of. Nope. Join us again next week. We will have the final video come out next week, and, and it will cover um, landlocked water. Mm-hmm. Uh, rivers and streams and ponds stories about that all right guys we'll see you guys later bye